Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next Quantum Gravity Across Approaches talk in our series on observations and phenomenology. Today, we've got Sachiko Kuruyanagi from the University Autonoma Madrid and Nagoya University here. And um, unusual for this season, we only have one speaker because when we were trying to prepare, we thought, oh, stochastic gravitational waves, that's something really cool. We should do more about gravitational waves. But we actually found very little work by people in the quantum gravity community working on that. Correct us if we're wrong, please send us all the links. I'm sure you have a lot of ideas. But so we thought we'd ask Sachiko to give us a talk about stochastic gravitational wave from the perspective of an expert on that to tell us in quantum gravity a bit more about what we should maybe be looking at. So um, thank you all for signing on and thank you Sachiko for agreeing, I think. Okay, then I share the screen. Yes, you can share, <laughs> please. Um, as yeah. usual, I will um, I will see who raises their hand for questions and who writes a question in the chat, and then I will let you know when you're free to speak and try to channel discussion. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy uh, to speak uh, my. Uh, recent work about the uh, stochastic gravitational wave background uh, in quantum gravity. So uh, this, uh, uh, the, the reference uh, is uh, uh, the work with Gianluca Calcani, uh, and uh, he took care of quantum gravity part, uh, and uh, I'm more uh, familiar with the gravitational wave experiments. So if you have a Questions related to quantum gravity, probably Januka can answer better. And I asked him to join. He, he cannot join at the beginning, but uh, probably he, he arrived late. So, yeah, uh, uh, hopefully he, he can answer uh, questions about quantum gravity. So, yeah, let me start as an introduction. Uh, so gravitational wave is uh, attractive because uh, it's the only way to directly observe the early universe. And uh, here I briefly uh, described the history of the universe. In the early universe, there are a lot of interesting high, high energy events like inflation, heating, phase transitions, and they all happened before the CMB. And the CMB is the oldest photon we can observe because before the CMB, the universe was dense and hot. So photons are scattered away by electrons. But on the other hand, gravitational waves can propagate freely even in the early universe because they interact weakly with matter. So in this way, we can, the gravitational waves can propagate uh, from directly from the early universe. So, and uh, interestingly, uh, this early universe events like inflation, reheating, phase transitions generate uh, sizable, depending on the model, but uh, it could generate a si sizable gravitational wave, stochastic gravitational wave. So, by looking, uh, by searching gra stochastic gravitational wave background, uh, we can obtain some insights uh, about uh, the early universe. So what is stochastic gravitational wave background? It's a continuous and random gravitational wave signal coming from all directions. And here I, I brought uh, some example of waveform and it looks uh, very similar to noise. Actually, we cannot distinguish uh, the stochastic gravitational wave background from noise just by looking at the waveform. So how can we detect it? Uh, the key is to take cross correlation between two detectors. So the signal at one detector is uh, uh, composed of signal H plus detector noise N here. Yeah. And what we do is to multiply these two uh, 
signal uh, at the detector and uh, integrate in terms of time. So if uh, I write it in terms of h and n, you see that here we have h square term and h times uh, n and n, n square term. And the point is that the detect, uh, detector noise should be independent. They shouldn't correlate. Uh, so if we, I mean, it's, it's kind of ideal situation there could be correlated noise or some global because of uh, some uh, global effect on the earth, but uh, Assuming that if there is no correlation between uh, noise of two detectors, we can suppress these uh, terms uh, by integrating uh, time. And uh, in this way, we can extract only gravitational wave signal. So uh, this is possible by uh, using uh, multiple detectors and uh, we, we can do it because nowadays we have uh, a lot of gravitational wave detectors in the world. So as many of you know, advanced LIGO started observation from 2015 and uh, they are already detecting a lot of binary black hole events. And also in Europe, advanced uh, Virgo started from 2017. 70 and uh, I it also joined the uh, like observation and uh, detect, detecting a lot of events now. And the Japanese Kagura joined uh, from 2020. Uh, at the uh, it joined the LIGO observation three, but uh, the sensitivity was very low. And uh, uh, actually, because of COVID, there was no overlap between observation time, so it couldn't contribute much. But we are also preparing the up updating, upgrading the sensitivity towards O4, and hopefully we can join and detect uh, some gra gravitational waves. And uh, there is also uh, a plan to move one of the LIGO detector to India. So LIGO actually have three detectors. One is used only for test. And uh, the plan is to move this uh, test detector to India and uh, build a new gravitational wave interferometer. So it could happen uh, 2025, but uh, I feel it, it's going to be a delay a bit, but uh, hopefully it happens in 2020s. And uh, in future, uh, as a future plan, uh, LIGO have, has several up upgrading plan. Uh, one is called uh, LIGO A+, plus, which is uh, happening uh, in, in a few years. And uh, there is another further upgrade plan called, called Voyager, and uh, hopefully uh, it will happen also in 2020s. And in 2030s, we have next generation experiment plan. So uh, Cosmic Explorer is uh, the plan in the US. It has a much longer arm, uh, arm length, 40 kilometers. So it can enhance the sen sensitivity a lot. Also in Europe, Einstein telescope is uh, uh, putting forward uh, and uh, it will have 10 kilometer arm lengths and uh, triangle. So this next generation detectors much, uh, has much better sensitivities uh, and uh, it's also powerful to probe stochastic gravitational wave background. So there are also other experiments like uh, we can go to space uh, to, to, to have uh, interferometer experiment, like Lisa is expecting a launch in 2034. And uh, also uh, there is a plan not, not decided for funding, but there is a plan uh, like Japanese Desaigo, Chinese thinking and Tai Chi. So uh, they, they also open a lot of possibilities to 
to detect, uh, uh, to explore gravitational waves at the different frequencies. And uh, also pulsar timing uh, uh, allows us to measure uh, low frequency gravitational waves. So it got uh, uh, attention because recently nanograv experiment uh, uh, indicated, uh, uh, announced that they found uh, possible gravitational wave signal. It's not confirmed uh, yet, but uh, uh, for, for confirmation, we have to wait a bit more to get more data, but uh, uh, possibly they are now seeing uh, gravitational waves from super binary, super massive black hole binaries. And uh, also uh, CMB uh, is uh, another way to in that indirectly detect gravitational waves. Uh, by looking at the beam mode polarizations, we can uh, search uh, large scale gravitational wave, which corresponds to the size of the universe today. So it's, it's very large scale, low frequency. And uh, there are uh, a lot of ground-based experiments going on, uh, actually uh, improving the sensitivity quite uh, well recently. And uh, there is also plan, uh, satellite plan called Light Bird, which is expecting a launch in 2029. 20, so here I plot uh, the sensitivity curves of future gravitational wave experiments. So on horizontal axis, we have frequency of gravitational wave, and the vertical axis is amplitude of gravitational wave, which is often characterized by omega GW. This is the quantity defined by the energy density of gravitational wave uh, per uh, frequency beam, uh, log, log frequency beam, divided by the critical density of the universe. So as you can see, uh, like ground-based interferometer experiments. This stands, LBK stands for LIGO Bilbo Kagura. Uh, this uh, can probe relatively high frequency gravitational waves, uh, Einstein telescope as well. And if we go to space, since we have longer arm lengths, we can uh, observe uh, low frequency gravitational wave like Lisa is probing uh, like 10 to 2, 10 to 3, 10 to minus 2, 10 to minus 3 uh, hertz. And uh, yeah, the SIGO is a kind of, uh, kind of uh, how to say, futuristic uh, gra gravitational wave experiment, but uh, it probes uh, gravitational wave of 0.1 hertz with uh, very good sensitivities. And the pulsar timing, uh, on the ha other hand, uh, measure much lower frequency, like 10 to minus 8, 10 to minus 9. It's, uh, the frequency is determined by the observation time. So it's uh, speed of light divided by observation time. So if we assume 10 years of observation, then the frequency we can probe is 10, about 10 to minus 9. And uh, CMB is looking at uh, the, uh, the size of the universe. So it's, it's much, much lower frequency. And uh, here I also plot uh, the typical spectrum uh, of gravitational waves from inflation. And uh, gravitational waves from inflation uh, uh, generate gravitation. So, so, sorry, inflation generates gravitational waves over a wide range of frequencies, like uh, this uh, uh, extends uh, 20 order of magnitude in terms of frequency. So it's, it's very wide. And also, also the, gravitation, the, the amplitude of gravitational wave is determined by the energy scale of inflation. So it's proportional to Hubble square during inflation. 
And uh, so, so in terms of tensor to scalar ratio, uh, this omega GW is proportional, linearly proportional to tensor to scalar ratio. And uh, for example, uh, uh, quadratic uh, inflation model predicts R equal 0.1. But it's already excluded by the CMB experiment. And uh, here I plot this spectrum by assuming Starobinsky inflation. In this case, the tensor to scalar ratio is 10 to minus 3. And uh, unfortunately, we cannot uh, reach the gravitational wave from inflation by any uh, interferometer experiment. So this is uh, quite uh, unfortunate. Uh, and to get the detectable signal, we need a blue tilted spectrum. But it's well known that it cannot be realized by standard solar low inflation. So we have to uh, consider something beyond standard solar low inflation. And uh, one possibility is to consider theories beyond uh, general relativity at the inflationary energy scale. And uh, the question we got is if there is any interesting models motivated by quantum gravity. So in this paper, we investigated uh, five different models uh, motivated uh, by quantum gravity. And uh, I will speak mainly about uh, non-local Starobinsky inflation, but uh, if I have time, I will also briefly uh, show the result for the other four models. So let's move on non-local Starobinsky inflation. Why it's interesting? Because uh, in, 2000, uh, in 2020, uh, we found this paper uh, indicating that uh, non-local Starobinsky inflation predicts a blue tilted spectrum. And uh, they say that uh, the spectral tilt can be even uh, as large as two, which is a lot. So the prediction was made at CMB scale. So we wanted to investigate uh, what, uh, uh, what's the amplitude of gravitational wave at the uh, interferometer scale. So, uh, just a brief uh, introduction about Starobinsky inflation. So Starobinsky inflation uh, is getting more popular and popular because it uh, gives good agreement. The prediction is good agreement with CMB observations. And uh, the model has this curvature squared correction to the Einstein-Hilbert action. And if you go to Einstein frame, uh, we get uh, one extra degree of one extra scalar degree of freedom, and uh, it has effective potential like this uh, plotted here, and this uh, uh, plateau here can uh, give slow roll inflation. So, and uh, what we consider is non-local Starobinsky inflation. So the difference from normal standard, uh, standard Starobinsky inflation is uh, we have this uh, wild tensor term, which is introduced to make the theory denormalizable. But this term vanishes in the, uh, the Friedman Robertson Walker background. And these form factors are introduced to preserve unitarity and also distance improve renormalizability. And the, the form factor chosen, are chosen in such a way that the theory becomes free of ghost on a given background. And uh, here I show the function form and it looks complicated, but uh, the point is that uh, we have this derivative on top of exponential exponential. And uh, if we tailor expand uh, this exponential term, then we get uh, infinitely many derivatives uh, in the form factor. And uh, in, the, in this way, we can improve renormal, renormal, 
la sorry no is ability so since we have action we can calculate the uh, 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 equation of motion for gravitational waves and uh, the only difference uh, from general relativity is here exponential factor and uh, and uh, yeah from this equation motion we can calculate uh, the primordial spectrum tensor primordial tensor spectrum and this again have a modification by the exponential factor and uh, from this we calculate uh, all observable observable quantity quantities like tensor to scalar ratio spectral index spectral running and uh, here uh, on the first term we have standard slow roll terms so it's suppressed at higher orders this n is e folding number of inflation and uh, the uh, th this uh, Additional terms uh, highlighted by red color, uh, they are uh, modification uh, by, by the uh, uh, non local uh, effect. And uh, here to derive this uh, formula, we used uh, some approximation, which is similar to slow roll approximation, but it's slightly different. So here, this star is given by the uh, rich scalar, and the rich scalar is proportional to Hubble square during inflation. And uh, we assume that this is slowly changing variable, which is true during if we assume inflation. So, uh, so the approximation here is that Z dot is small. And uh, to plot, uh, to know the uh, amplitude of gravitational wave today, we have to use this uh, formula to translate uh, primordial spectrum into the uh, into omega GW today. So this, this formula has a transfer function here, and the transfer function uh, describes the uh, Hubble expansion effect. So Hubble expansion history after inflation affects the spectral shape of the of gravitational wave. So and this transfer function uh, gives that effect. So here I, I plot the typical shape of gravi uh, spectral uh, omega G double. And if we have early matter phase, uh, like during reheating, if the universe behaves like matter dominated universe, then we get the suppression pro uh, proportional to the uh, K2 minus square. And during radiation dominated phase, uh, by the way, uh, so th this corresponds to the mode which uh, enters the horizon. So, so the, the gravitational waves are stretched during inflation and comes back into the horizon. And uh, the effect of uh, uh, expansion uh, is determined when the mode enters the horizon. So the high frequency mode corresponds to the mode which enters the horizon in, uh, soon after inflation. And the low frequency gravitational waves correspond to the mode which enters the horizon recently. So the effect of early matter phase arises at the high frequency and the radiation domination uh, continues quite a while. So we have this flat uh, plateau uh, in, in the mid, no, intermediate frequency. And uh, then after radiation domination, we have matter dominated universe. So again, the spectrum goes up because of the difference in Hubble expansion. And uh, on top of this effect, we have tilt on because of, because of primordial spectrum has uh, typically typically has tilt. So so this spectral index nt describes the 
リニアチェンジ、リニアディクリーズオブプライモディアルスペクトラム、and the spectral running describes、uh, the uh, quadratic decrease. And of course, if you, we include higher terms, the spectrum, the spectrum tend to decrease more at high frequency. So, this is、uh, how we calculate、uh, omega GW today. And、uh, we did it、uh, for our、uh, for non local、uh, Starobinsky model because we have expression、uh, already、uh, showed a few slides ago. So, we have, by the way, we have, to, we have several choices for form factor. And here we picked the Kuzmin form factor. And,、uh, And check the how, how gravitational wave today l o o k So, when we consider the only、uh, first and the second, so NT and alpha T, then the, we, we found the spectrum、uh, grows towards high frequency, and we got excited、uh, that、uh, it can reach、uh, future graph, it can be. Uh, tested by future gravitational wave experiments. But、uh, when we start to include higher order terms, like third order term, fourth order term, then we found out the spectrum s t a r t to the behavior change and、uh, it diverge. So eventually, we decided to plot it with exact formula. And,、uh, and found out that the slow roll approximation doesn't, doesn't work at high frequency. And、uh, it doesn't reach any, sense,、uh, any uh, future gravitational wave sensitivity. So the reason is that uh, 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 I see. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I think、sorry. Alan has a question. Sachiko, can you go back one slide? Yeah. Do, do you understand what sets the scale of the, of the transition between the growing, the blue shifted behavior and the constant behavior?、Um, yeah, it should be. Yeah, so this constant behavior is basically when the theory, is, theory recovers general relativity. And here you see the effect of non local effect. I'm just wondering like, whether there's a parameter that sets that scale, because if, if there is, then. I think so, yeah. I, I, I didn't do it, but、uh, it, it should be possible to find、uh, the scale here, the transition scale. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, the reason、uh, why we got this, uh, uh, the, the reason why slow roll approximation didn't work is that uh, uh, this non local corrections diverge when, when this z star is larger than one, which is actually the regime where the non local effect is large. So, this, this is a uh, uh, parameter region we are interested in. And、uh, in that region, we, we cannot use this approximation. So that, that was the reason. So we decided to use only exact formula and、uh, explore the different parameters for Kuzmin form factor. But、uh, any of the、uh, parameters didn't give detectable gravitational wave. And it was the same for different form factor. We tried the Tombris form factor,、uh, and the result was similar. It, it always suppresses the gravitational wave at low frequency. And、uh, we also tried the monomial form factor. The result is similar, <laughs> it's not reaching any experiments. And、uh, eventually,、uh, the reason is that uh, uh, when we recover, we, we want to recover general relativity、uh, at the end of inflation. 
and uh, uh, the uh, gravitational waves uh, at the end of inflation correspond to high frequency. Gravitational waves produced uh, at the end of inflation are high frequency. Uh, on the other hand, the gravitational waves produced uh, at the uh, early epoch of inflation, uh, it, it corresponds to low frequency. So we always want uh, this uh, exponential factor one at the end of inflation, which means that uh, the gravitational wave spectrum should converge to standard Starobinsky inflation at high frequency. And standard Starobinsky inflation does not give high amplitude. So that's why we always do not have a large gravitational wave amplitude at high frequency. So this was a kind of a, a negative result in terms of for future experiments. But the main message we got is that the blue tilted spectrum at the CMB scale does not always mean a detectable signal at the interferometer scale. The behavior of the spectrum can change at the intermediate scale. So we, it's kind of dangerous to use slow roll approximation from the CMB scale. So we, we always have to be careful uh, when we want to explore it, uh, like uh, uh, 10 orders of magnitude uh, in terms of frequency. So this is a uh, uh, main one of the uh, main take home message. So also uh, for non-local Stalopinsky inflation, we didn't get the interesting uh, uh, result, but we explored other model so I have time right yeah so yeah we explore the other models for example uh, this is Brandon bug, bug for non-commutative inflation uh, so this mo in this model time and space coordinates do not commute so, so it, it has this uh, condition and uh, I, I do not uh, explain that detail of the model, but uh, uh, it can enhance the spectrum at the high frequency. And uh, uh, yeah, here, uh, this uh, uh, solid line is a non non-commutative case. Actually, we find enhancement, uh, uh, slight, very small enhancement, but uh, we, we find enhancement at the high frequency. So, so this may be uh, motivating for the cyber experiment, but it cannot reach uh, LISA or Einstein telescope. So this is one case. And uh, the other model uh, is multifractional space-time. So uh, the, in this model, the dimension of space-time changes with uh, the pro probable scale. And in this case, we found the enhancement of the spectrum at high frequency, but eventually we noticed that when we take into account higher order, like alpha t, then it actually suppresses a lot the, the spectrum. This is because the, the amplification factor alpha, it, it affects, uh, it, it, it has a minus value. So in the case of NT, it gives, uh, uh, so, so usually NT in slow roll inflation is negative. So if we multiply alpha, then it gives a positive NT, which enhances the spectrum. But uh, when we look at the second order uh, uh, for alpha T, it gives alpha square, so it's always positive. So negative alpha t is becomes negative alpha t, and so so this was the reason we didn't get the enhancement. Actually, we got suppression. So this was not very uh, didn't come out uh, uh, as interesting model. 
Um, sorry, yeah. just a question to the last. So this, I'm not familiar with the multifractional space times model. So this is really just if the space time changes dimension with scale, which is an effect we know to happen quite frequently, or are there any additional assumptions yeah. in there? Yeah, I I think what you said is correct, but uh, Gianluca can answer better. <laughs> and uh, okay, uh, I don't see him yet, but so. Uh, okay, I'll put a pin in it and ask again later. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So the fourth model is string gas cosmology. Uh, it produces both scalar and tensor primordial spectrum via thermal mechanism alternative to inflation. And uh, this one uh, uh, doesn't have ex exact formula for to describe primordial tensor spectrum. So uh, we have to extrapolate from CMB scale. So, but uh, we could obtain upper bound from the full expression. We, we do not have a shape of the spectrum, but at least we could give upper bound. So, uh, Actually, the ex, uh, extrapolation from CMB scale uh, gives a large amplitude at high frequency. But uh, if we look at upper bound, uh, it indicates that uh, it, it should be suppressed uh, at some point, uh, like, uh, like uh, in, in the same way what happened uh, for non local Starobinsky inflation. So at maximum, it can reach the SIGO, but not the Lisa and Einstein telescope. And uh, the last model uh, is uh, the most interesting in terms of observation. Uh, so it has a uh, contraction phase called expirosis and, and, uh, and bounce, and uh, then the universe gets the expansion again. And the perturbations are generated by brain collision in this model. So this model also doesn't have exact expression for the primordial tensor perturbation. So we had to explore it from CMB scale. And at the maximum, it can reach Einstein telescope. But uh, at, uh, in, in, on the other hand, it could be also uh, 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 have a very red uh, tilted spectrum. So in that case, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, not detectable by any future experiment. So this model has a very large uncertainty. So we still have to explore, but it could be interesting. So one, the last, uh, lastly, I have to note that here, it uh, it's reaching uh, the BBN bound, BBN uh, so uh, this is uh, the bound from the fact that uh, the gravitational wave shouldn't interrupt uh, uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So, so if there is too much gravitational waves in the early universe, it changes the Hubble, it affects uh, as an extra radiation component and uh, changes the Hubble expansion rate. And in this way, it can interrupt the uh, big one nucleosynthesis. So, so from that fact, we can put uh, upper bound on the amplitude of gravitational wave. And uh, since this spectrum is reaching here, uh, maybe you consider that this is not, uh, this is already rejected, but it, this is not true because uh, as I showed in the previous slide, the Hubble expansion after inflation or alternative of inflation affects the uh, uh, amplitude of gravitational wave. So if we consider early matter phase, uh, which is kind of motivated because uh, it, it's possible that the heating is proceeded by decay of uh, scalar field, uh, in the case of inflation, we, people usually consider inflaton decays into particles. And during this phase, the scalar field oscillates at the bottom of the potential. And uh, 
uh, that gives matter dominated phase. So if we have scalar field oscillating at the bottom of the potential, then this early matter phase it can be easily uh, can easily take place. So it's kind of motivated. And uh, if we have early matter phase, the, the gravitational wave gets sharp suppression. So that means that uh, this uh, blue tilted spectrum can bend at some point. In this way, we can avoid the BBN bound. So here is uh, the summary. So uh, gravitational wave can become a powerful probe of the very early universe. And uh, gravitational wave from inflation uh, should exist. But the question is, uh, what is the amplitude? And it's typically very small for standard stroller inflation. And uh, we explore the non-local Starobinsky inflation, uh, which pro predicts a blue tilted uh, gravitational wave spectrum at CMB scale, but uh, we found out that uh, uh, at the high frequency, uh, the behavior change and it doesn't uh, give large amplitude of gravitational wave. And uh, we also explored other models of quantum gravity, and uh, some models uh, can be explored by DeSaigo but not likely by Lisa. And uh, only the model uh, reached the Einstein telescope was this equipyrotic model, but this uh, equipyrotic model needs more theoretical development. So I think that it, uh, maybe I finished a bit early, but uh, I, I take a question. <laughs> Thank you very much. This was a great talk. Um, so yeah, I guess everyone else will be clapping quietly. Um, yes, uh, we have plenty of time for questions. So um, please raise your hands. Uh, ah, yeah, the order, you can go ahead. Yeah, yeah, uh, it was a nice talk. I just wanted, um, I, I missed the sort of the, the punchline in the following sense that out of all the models that you considered, um, was non-local Starobinsky uh, sort of the, uh, the best model vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, the upcoming experiments and uh, detection using uh, gravitational interferometry, or was there another competing one? Uh, so sorry, maybe I didn't get that. So, so you, you had a bunch of models, right? And so which one, in your opinion, was sort of best for uh, interferometry? Uh, among these mo five models. Sorry? Among these five models. Yes, 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 uh, yes. Uh, I think the last one is the most interesting. But the, the new ekpyrotic scenario? Yeah, but it's the most... Uh, uh, how do you say, uh, not developed uh, in terms of uh, theory. We, we need uh, more investigation to, to, to construct uh, the model. Does this uh, new periodic scenario uh, uh, fit into this new discussion of uh, uh, Steinhardt at all about the slow contraction and the quantum stability as opposed to quantum instability inflationary models? Mm, maybe I don't know about this. Uh, I think okay, so they have they have some uh, they have some numerical relativity studies right with Franz Pretorius and various other people, Steinhardt at all. They call it slow contraction. Mm -hmm. Does this fit into that? You don't know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, that's fine. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, ah, are you? Yeah. Yeah. To answer question. Yeah, I just wanted to. Um, yeah, yeah. It's not. Um, it's a different scenario. In, uh, in this case, uh, uh, there is an extra S brain in the spectrum. Uh, and um, mm, this scenario has been proposed by Vandenberg and his collaborator. And it's uh, kind of different from um, the slow contraction one uh, you, were, um, you were mentioning. It's a very recent one. Okay. Maybe we ask, uh, 
another question when, when you are yes. not here <laughs> uh, I got the question about uh, uh, what was it I yeah. think my question can wait a little bit longer Gregorio Carulo has been raising his hand so I'll come back to my own question I definitely yeah. won't forget it but okay Gregorio you can go ahead Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I had my problems. So thanks, Sachiko. This was uh, very instructive. Uh, I, I have a comment because maybe I'm kind of missing something. So I, I am an observer, but I usually study transient signals. So I'm not very familiar with uh, stochastic detections. Uh, but for example, if you go back to the exact solution for the you no know, local star Rubisky, so, so you showed a, plot, a similar plot here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. For example, this one, right? So you're saying um, that, so you're showing essentially the power spectral density, right? So that's, that's mm -hmm. what, so the, the curves you're showing for the detectors are apparent, so related to the power spectral densities. Uh, yeah. But so the fact that, the, um, you know, the prediction is below the power spectral density, mm -hmm. uh, why does it exclude detection? Because, you know, these are, it's true they are stochastic, right? But they are persistent signals. So if I keep my detectors on for like 10 years, 20 years, that, that effectively will push the power spectral density down, right? So yeah, yeah, the yeah, fact yeah, that right. it's below the SIGO, it doesn't mean that it's not detectable. It means that, you know, we need maybe 20 years of the mission to detect it. Am I wrong? Yeah, or... yeah, yeah. You, you are right. And you got the good point. Yes, so I, here I think I assume the three years of observation and uh, if you increase observation time, it should increase root square of observation time. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, of course, for the missions, it, this factor will be, you know, kind of small because we know that space missions are normally come in the limited range. But for probably for ground-based interferometers, we, we can be confident to go maybe uh, hopefully one or two orders of magnitude because hopefully interferometers can stay up. Uh, yeah, yeah. They are functioning for you know, a long time. But yeah, thanks. Uh, I, it was just to clarify for, for me. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. So that means even if the favorite mod our favorite model is not detectable yet, if we wait long enough, we might. Now, yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, it's a root to square. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> let's be optimistic and say we have time. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, as you said earlier, um, I had a question and uh, Gianluca uh, Sachiko said you might be able to clarify that. I was wondering about the multifractional space times, um, what the additional assumptions there were. Is this just about a dimension dependence of space time? What form of dimension dependence of space time or is there anything else that's happening? Um, not sure if I, 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 I caught your question, but uh, I would say, um, this effect uh, um, on the stochastic background uh, depends uh, on uh, a varying dimension, both of space time and the momentum space. The two things uh, are actually related to each other, but um, uh, in, in this particular case, uh, it depends on the changes of uh, momentum space time dimension. I don't know if uh, this answers your question, but yeah, um, but if we formulate yes. it. Uh, Yes, I think it, because I was wondering, like, um, best known example is uh, causal dynamical triangulations where the spectral dimension of space time changes with dimension. And I was wondering if, so this might have some implication for all kinds of discrete theories that have a varying spectral dimension, if um, there might be a connection there, but it sounds like you need the additional momentum space dimensional change, which I don't know if it's given. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, it may be related to the changing, a change in space time, uh, spectral dimension. But uh, mm, uh, here it's more complicated because uh, the, um, it is related also to the Hausdorff dimension and in turn, sorry, I have a child here agitating. And, no um, problem. <laughs> um, uh, on the Hausdorff dimension of momentum space. So one can show that there is a relation between the spectral dimension and these two houses of dimensions. So in principle, yes, it has to do with the variation of the spectral dimension, but uh, you can uh, consider different scenarios with different spectral relations, and this is a, just a particular one. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, is this a new question, Gregorio, or is your hand just still up? Okay. Um, any more questions? We still have plenty of time. Thank you very much for the explanation. If there is a time, I wanted to ask one thing to to everyone. I, I mean, for uh, I was wondering if there is a more interesting model so to to probe by gravitational wave. So, and one thing is that uh, if we have a large scalar perturbation, not not necessarily tensor, uh, if you can amplify the scalar sector, scalar perturbation then it can also induce gravitational wave at second order. And uh, I was wondering if there is a model motivated by quantum gravity to enhance uh, the scalar perturbation at the uh, small scale. So like, uh, it, like it's similar to produce PVH, uh, you enhance uh, the spectrum at the uh, small scale and uh, and uh, produce large, large uh, density fluctuation and eventually you get the uh, PVH. But the, here it's for gravitational wave, it's not necessary to make PVH even if uh, slight enhancement of uh, scalar perturbation could generate uh, something interesting. So if you can think of some models, let me know. Great. I like the change in perspective, the speaker asking the audience for <laughs> a question. So I hope we have someone in the audience who can uh, maybe say something. Unfortunately, I work on very discrete things and uh, usually we're not far enough to include matter. But Okay, if there are no answers and no more questions, then I suppose um, we are done for today. If you do come up with answers or more questions, please uh, go visit our Slack channel and um, hopefully keep the discussion going there. And um, yeah, thank you all very much for tuning in. There will be a next talk. I have forgotten what it's about, but maybe one of the other three can tell me what it will be. Come on, Sebastian, Sebastian, Aaron, one of you tell me <laughs> what our next event talk is. I, I think it's supposed to be constraints on like from particle physics, including matter, stuff like that. Oh, right. Related it's to the effective uh... field theories talks. Okay, great. So next time, swamp land again. Yeah. <laughs> back to the swamp after we've looked up at the sky now. So thank you all and um, hopefully see you next time. <laughs>